Hello, everyone. I am Glenn Moyes. I'm Adam Weber. And this is a supplemental to the first podcast, because you know how it oh, is. It's a new podcast. Do you want to call us a new podcast? It's a new podcast. Okay, it's a new podcast. It's a um, short podcast, but it's a new very short one it's it's one of those things where we, it's like you know th- we were talking about where we are as far as kind of what our thought process is for writing stories and there's one extreme well i guess two but there's a very 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 important aspect of the process which we totally forgot about and really i think it's it seems like the most important part of this whole process and it's this and I'm using the term that uh, Orson Scott Card gave in his. Uh, it was one of the two books. It was either it was either Characters and Viewpoint or I think it was Characters and Viewpoint. Um, I'm pretty sure this one was. Yeah, he talked about how you need to interrogate your characters. We have characters that are making certain decisions for certain reasons, and we kind of go in our head okay, why is this character making this decision? Does that, does it even make sense? And often what will happen is uh, it won't make sense or it will change something in the story that works better, but then it doesn't work with what that character wanted to do and what their you know thoughts were for doing this action. And interrogating our characters to make sure that they are making um, decisions that they think are right. This includes the bad guys. The thing to remember is that every single character in a story is a real person, or at least you have to think of them as a real person. This person has a history, a background. They um, had a family, at least at one point, um, if not now. And every decision that they make has to revolve around these things. Every decision that they make has to be something that that person would really do in in their situation, assuming that that person was real. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because if, if they don't seem real, then the audience won't believe it is and that's yeah, if they do something that this person wouldn't do or they do something that's made sense why didn't he just do this and that's one thing that drives me nuts is when you when i'm watching a movie and i'm thinking he totally could have dropped that ring off of one of the giant eagles and i'm sitting here in the middle of the movie and just thinking this and just thinking why didn't you just take this easy solution that could have uh that could have bypassed all of this trouble you wouldn't have to go through Mordor. You wouldn't have to get you know stabbed by a spider. You wouldn't have had to. You wouldn't have to fight all those battles. Yeah. You know, one of us could have died. <laughs> yeah. No, the the problem is, is if something like that happens, something like that's in your story, it's going to drive your audience nuts. Even if they don't vocally say it, uh, even the guys that will just go, "Oh, it was just a movie. Doesn't matter. It's it's fiction." The problem is, is that that takes away believability, and as soon as you lose believability, you lose tension. And that's a huge part of the experience. Even if you like the movie, or, or uh, in our case, comic or a book, it could have been so much better if there were no problems in there, if there were no contrived actions. Yeah, and to solve that problem, again, we just have to interrogate the story. We have to interrogate the world. We have to interrogate the characters. We discuss a long time i mean i don't know if we want to give a percentage but it's it is very common for us to just sit there on a on a piece of dialogue and go over it over and over again and go i don't like this he wouldn't really say this this doesn't sound like this character or why in the world is he doing what he's doing this makes no sense and then we have to go back and and either justify it or half the time we change what they're doing so that it, it fits with the story and, and this is what this character would actually do. And there are a few instances where we had to rewrite entire chapters in order to uh, in order to make it work. There's a lot of things that come to the surface when you are writing dialogue for a character. And, and one of the things we've noticed is if there is dialogue that's taking a long time to write, it's usually because we don't understand the characters enough. Or what we understood about the characters is completely wrong. Or stupid, usually both. But you know, it's. <laughs> um, you, you need to really know who your characters are. Yeah, because it was like the second chapter. There's this big, huge line of dialogue that the bad guy was saying, and we had such a hard time with that, and we ended up having to, you know, figure out the guy's backstory. And again, all of those. Uh, what does this character want? Why are they doing this? And. You know, and how then, did the character get where he was? Why does he have this opinion? How did he form this opinion? Yeah. What is the opinion that he has? Yeah, where did he get the opinion from? Or are they lying? Is this not their opinion at all? There's all kinds of different 
things would be going on. And if that isn't really figured out well, the dialogue is going to be hard because the dialogue isn't going to be good. And, you know, luckily we can, you know, we realize that, okay, yeah, this dialogue is not working. <laughs> um, at, least we, at least we think Sometimes so. You hear, you hear dialogue and you just cringe in a movie. It's like, oh, that is so, such bad dialogue. Or, oh, that just sounds so wrong. Yippee! No! What, <laughs> no! What happens is when the piece of dialogue that the character says uh, is contrary to what you know about that character as an audience, it's like, I, I feel like I know this guy. I've gone through this whole journey with him for the last two hours, and then he drops this line that you're just sitting there like, what in the world? Did he totally just say that? That seems out of character for him. Suddenly that dialogue is going to feel contrived. It's not going to feel realistic. It's going to feel scripted. This wasn't a living, breathing person behind the dialogue saying this, expressing his thoughts. This was a script writer that's trying to figure out how to make the scene work and just said, ah, screw it and put something down. Yeah. Oh, no one will notice. It's just a movie. <laughs> yeah, no one will notice. It's fiction. Or, or what's even worse is I'm a genius. I can do no wrong. <laughs> oh yeah. That's that, that one's worse, but, um, I don't need your critiques. <laughs> so, and it's, yeah, it's just interrogating characters. Um, and the, the second part of this whole thing, which again, we forgot to bring up last was a couple of weeks ago. I think it was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Um, is, and I, I guess, I think Story Fanatic blog um, mentions this a lot. Stories are about solving problems. Um, we come up with an idea or a world or a character or something, and we take you that character. Con- yeah, you, you create a conflict. You You present the characters with extremely difficult problems. If it's a dumb problem or it's like simple solution, I mean, okay, if the audience already knows what the solution of the problem is, then the, the conflict isn't good enough. So what this, because you want your character, you want to look at these characters and be like, that is the most awesome thing I've, oh, that character is so smart. It's all, oh, you know, it's just like, wow, these guys are geniuses. I, I need to, you know, I want to read this more because holy crap, these characters are awesome. I never would have thought of that. And it totally makes sense with, within the world and the, everything. So it's in the context of what's going on. Right. I mean, um, see, Adam, you were talking about there's there's two types of genius. There's real genius and false genius as yes. far as characters. Yeah, go, go. In, in, char- in characters in fiction, there's two different types of geniuses that you'll see. There's the real genius and then there's the fake genius. And a real genius will come up with a solution. They'll be presented with a really difficult problem and then they'll come up with a solution that the audience already knew all the information that you would need to build this solution. And the solution is usually simple, elegant and simple. And it would totally work. And the audience will sit there and look at it and go, holy crap, I totally didn't think of that. But it was all right there. Oh, my goodness, this character is so smart. The fake genius is the one that I see a lot more often, especially in anime. They're the biggest uh, offender on this. But yeah. I see it a lot in film as well. And, yeah. and I've also noticed it a lot in books. The character will have some piece of information that's been withheld from the audience, or uh, Harry Potter's really bad about this. They'll pull a magic spell out of their ass that was never before mentioned, never before part of the story. This spell would have been great to have two chapters back, and suddenly that will get them out of the solution and go, I'm a genius, I knew about that spell that would have been useful earlier in the story. And so then all of a sudden you have, it's like this plot armor that you put around this character where they, and that's a TV tropes term, by the way. Oh, is it? No. Yeah. No. Plot first, armor. first time I heard of it. I like it. <laughs> you, you put this plot armor around the character where they can't be killed because if you ever put them in danger, the audience knows at this point that um, he's just going to pull another spell out of nowhere and save himself. And it'll be a spell that the audience never heard of. Oh, it's like, pfft, he's not in any danger. He knows all the spells, even though the audience doesn't. And probably the author didn't until they got to that scene. So fake geniuses, the problem with fake geniuses, when you're watching a film or reading a book or whatever, and you have a character who's a fake genius, you don't have any tension. You you don't feel like, what's this character going to do next? Because you know what he's going to do next. He's going to pull something out of his hat. With a real genius, those are the guys that you sit at the edge of your seat and go, what's this guy going to do? You know, And, you, and you're sitting there trying to figure out what it's going to be. You're looking at all the things in the room, or you're looking at the situation. And then, and then he totally comes out of left field and blows the bad guy out of the water just with his genius. He's the type of character that that can 
take out his enemy without using any kind of weapon or anything that he brought with him. And you're sitting there watching this and going, how did he do this? That totally makes sense. He, he's a type of character that you won't have like this big, obvious, oh, there's a chandelier with a rope tied off to the side. Gee, I wonder what he's going to do. You don't see it coming at all. Yeah. And for the record, that's one of the reasons why both Adam and myself really, really, really liked Death Note. Um, it's also part of the reason why it's taken us such a long time to write Hackberry Hollow, because we're trying to write characters like this. Yeah. And and guys, whoever's listening, even if you don't like anime, give Death Note a try. Watch the first and second episodes, and especially at the end of the second episode, where we're talking about how characters are really, really smart. Um, yeah, you'll be hooked <laughs> after the end of the second episode. Yeah. Um, I, I will give a warning with Death Note. There are a few things in there that, that they did, like conclusions that the character came through that were kind of a jump. It's one of those things where it, it's so enjoyable and so genius you got to give it a few hall passes on things like that because they do need to get the story going. Yeah. But overall, I thoroughly enjoyed it. it. It was very good. Yeah, there's so much of it that was so well thought out that even when, as you said, some conclusions are a bit of a stretch, you're just like, I don't, well, wow, I don't care. <laughs> it's like, yeah. or sometimes you just, you just totally miss it because, yeah. There were a few st- stretches in there that I, I, missed but there are other ones that that i was just like ah oh well this is still awesome yeah (laughs) uh so but so yeah uh, stories are about solving problems and your characters are going they need to be presented with very difficult problems and um i think there is and see uh we can't spoil anything and I don't want to bleep anything else, anything out like we had to do last time when we tried to spoil something. Um, but <laughs> um, ah, okay, you know. Oh well. <laughs> Every time you do that, that's 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 more work for me, because <laughs> I have to bleep it out. Okay. Um. Anywho. Jeez. Sorry. So. Basically, the trick was we had to come up with a way to make this character tell a lie and then have the have the, it make sense that the other character would believe the lie. Yeah. And it was one of those things where I mean, it took us four hours to come up. Well, I guess six in total um, to come up with a solution. But this character was able to just, you know, figure it out. Um, but that's the thing is. So there's situations like that where you have to spend, you know, several hours or I don't think we've ever had anything like a scene that took us um, days to figure out how they're going to get out of it. Well, actually, yeah, there is. Uh, yeah, there are a couple. Yeah, there's a couple. But that one, I mean, we were really happy with the solution to that one. But um, so, and that was something that that character had to figure out in like you know 20 seconds or less. But with uh, other bigger problems that the characters have to overcome, which is like you know the the major plot the major conflict in the story how are they going to solve it the characters would have a lot more time to figure out the solution to the problem than we as writers would have maybe i mean in the case of this because this i think the story that we're writing takes place over a period of like two years or something like that yeah it's it's two years yeah two years um but there's other stories that could like take place in a matter of say 24 hours and um so anything but dan brown yeah it's there's a lot of problem solving and we are not as smart as our characters in the story, but we have to figure it out. And that the takes characters us... are smarter than we are, but we have the advantage of being able to spend hours figuring out something they have to come up with in seconds because that's what it takes for us. Um, but you got to do it. Yeah. Be smart yeah. So, but you, you got to do it. Sticking to your guns. Seriously. If you're writing a story and if there's difficult problems, Never, ever, 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 ever take the easy way out. Think about it. Figure out solutions that would make perfect sense. If there are difficult problems that you think that your characters couldn't get out of, put them in it anyway. Just stick to it. Don't be like, oh, this this little thing that would actually happen in real life wouldn't happen to this main character because it's just too darn hard to figure out a solution to it. Don't don't do that. You got to figure out a solution. So we are going to end this podcast because Adam and I. We're going to finish writing chapter 17. Yep, 17. All right, let's get her done. Let's get her done. All right, so here we are, Hackberry Hollow writing team, signing off once again. See you, everybody. Yep, bye. Bye.